This is Tyrese Halliburton, and you're listening to Setting the Pace. What is going on, Pacer Nation? Welcome back to another episode here of your go-to Pacers podcast. I'm your host, Alex Golden. And unfortunately, the Pacers tried their best to make this a comeback, but it was too little, too late. Indiana Falls 150 to 145 in a very weird game against the Los Angeles Lakers. And here to talk to me about that is former Area 55 member and Pacers super fan, Gentry Hudson, making his setting the pace debut. Gentry, what's up, man? How are you? Roy, 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 you know, if you're in Area 55, that is how we would do it in our day. Happy to represent. Um, shout out Pacers Nation, you know, utterly crushed. Not only that I missed the Houston game, but that I had to just watch a typical LeBron James. I don't know if you want to call it a wine fest. I don't know if you want to just call it a zebra stampede. But, man, I mean, just a little demoralized. Not how I wanted to start my Monday morning. But, hey, I'm on setting with the pace with Alex Golden. I mean, how much better can you start your week? I mean, come on now. I, I like the setup there. Uh, what did you call it, a zebra stampede or a wine fest? Zebra, yeah, one of the two. I mean, really, we got to try, I think, both white and red. Um, and then we also just got completely ambushed, uh, eight-on-five style. If you yeah. know, you know. Yeah, so uh, obviously we're going to start things off with the foul discrepancy because it was pretty atrocious for Indiana versus the Lakers. 43 free throw attempts for the Lakers, 16, just 16 for the Indiana Pacers. And, you know, it's bad enough when you have the owner of the Pacers, Steve Simon, chiming in on Twitter, replying to one of my tweets about the foul stuff, saying, yeah, they're taking it to us, but there's no way it should be this big of a, a, of a discrepancy. So, you know, you, you kind of feel that. But in a five-point game, Ginger, I will say this. The Pacers missing seven free throws could have been the difference in the game. Now, here's where I, I was just looking at the team stats. 59 to 50 on field goals. Like, we hit, made nine more shots than them. When it came to threes, we outscored them 18 threes to 12. Um, we're looking at uh, rebounds. It was 40 41. And then we had 39 to 28 assists. And then I thought this was interesting. We had more fast break points than them. So, I mean, by all means, I mean, let's just say they shoot 28 free throws instead of 38. You know, I, I'm just talking marginally less. I think. I mean, we're in it a little bit more. And I think what really did it was I noticed, like, late in the second, Rick was playing a full bench lineup, which was really when the slide started. Um, I mean, when you have Shepard, McDermott, and Obi in there, I mean, you just know the defense is going to be a little sus. Um, but I think that compounded with just the master class. We were talking about the Zebra Stampede, the wine fest, and the third. I mean, really – the fact that we were able to claw back, I think, still says a lot about this team. Yeah, it really does. I mean, during that stretch, like you mentioned, I think there was like five minutes and 35 seconds left, something like that, in the second quarter. Miles Turner gets fouled by Anthony Davis when he jumps in the air like it was a blatant, obvious foul. Davis and LeBron have this meeting with Mark Davis under the basket for like 30 seconds, and it made no sense to me because the Pacers were called for a delay of game right after that foul was called for something, I think, related to the bench or something like that. And then all of a sudden, Davis and LeBron hold up Mark Davis for 30 seconds, which is more of a delay of the game. They don't get called for anything. And after that, seven fouls were called on the Pacers to end the second half, zero on the Los Angeles Lakers. Tell me that's not a coincidence. But then you go back, the Pacers, the next time they got a foul called for them, I believe it was with uh, 6.57 in the third. So they went from 5.35 in the second quarter all the way to 6.57 in the third without getting a foul call. Pascal Siakam got a tech in between that. So it was just definitely one of those things where it was frustrating. Clearly, you know, Los Angeles is a physical team. There's no doubt about it. Indiana was not good defensively in this game, and they were kind of scrambling, trying to figure out ways to kind of keep Davis from kind of having a mismatch advantage, and they were overplaying LeBron and things like that because that's what those two guys do. But I, I just felt like there was a lot of calls that were – not being called on one end, but called on the other end. There was a very inconsistent whistle, and the Pacers, of course, were on the on the wrong side of that after LeBron and his posses went to the officiating crew to kind of plead their case over and over and over again. So just, just very disappointing. I think, like, the part for me, like, players on both sides are going to chirp. But, like, even, like, at, at the end of the game when Pascal got to the line and LeBron was just, like, appalled. Like, it's just like, man, you have got it all night. Like, it's end of game. I mean, y'all have shot 22 more free throws than us, and you're still chirping away. Like, honestly, just, like, th there's minimal time left. You've choked the lead. 
I mean, you trying to, you know, be in the playoffs and be him, this and that. I mean, yeah, it's just little things like that. It, I, I kind of, you know, if you remember the Raptors coach, Darko Radjakovic, going off earlier in the season about, you know, future all-star Scotty Barnes, and he had that whole spiel. That was the energy I had after the game. I probably didn't sit the last five minutes. And I think just watching LeBron even foul in light of all that, I think was just adding kind of the, the disappointment that I had. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I think there's that play, too, in the second quarter we need to talk about where they called a charge, or excuse me, yeah, I think it was a charge on Obi Toppin. Yeah. And Rick Carlisle challenged a call. Clearly, Torian Prince, Torian Prince was not set. And he was still moving his feet when his foot was off the ground. <laughs> yeah, it, it was clearly a chart or clearly a yeah. block. And of course, they said, oh, he was in legal guarding position, which I didn't understand that at all. So to me, it, it was just like a, a downward spiral. And I really do think that as a fan, if you're watching it and it's, and it's upsetting you when you're getting officiated like this, it does play a factor with the players. And I think it's hard sometimes to play and continue to play at a high level when you feel like you're getting called for a foul every time you're playing defense. So I do think that the the officiating did impact the way the Pacers did go out there and defend. Now, they were not playing good defense. Their rotations were bad a lot tonight. But, I, I mean, you give them 150 points in a game, that's ridiculous, right? So, yeah. you know, yeah. this, this Pacers team has made improvements defensively, too. They were fourth in defense the last eight games in the league. So, like, clearly they've been playing better. But, I, Gentry, I just felt like the, the way the officials were calling this game, it impacted the Pacers quite a bit. Yeah, I think the other thing I will say that was like Neesmith got in the foul trouble early, a lot like the midseason tournament. I love Neesmith just like not only on LeBron, but just like with the way he crashes, dies, splashes all over the place. I, I feel like he just goes hard. And I think what was hard in this series or this game in particular was that we didn't have Matherin um, off the bench either. And I know Matherin's not necessarily a stand-up defender by any means. I definitely take him over Toppin, McDermott, or Shepard, not the rag on them. But it's not necessarily even his defense, but I would say it's just like the intensity and the way he he kind of play hard as well. And I think that that hole was definitely a little more obvious than I think it had been in previous games, where not only was he missing on offense, but just his intensity on both sides, just kind of I guess his mindset, his mentality. Um, you know, I mean, before he got drafted, he was talking about how he wanted to take on LeBron pretty early. I mean, that was some smack earlier in his career. I think tonight when Lee Smith got into that trouble early, it was where, you know, was, you would have just loved to see him in all of this. I know that's something a lot of people haven't mentioned. I'm glad that he's been able to recover. Quinn was saying on the broadcast, um, he, he's looked great. I think the last time they caught up, um, but along with the foul trouble, I was thinking that, you know, if, if Ben was in this, I kind of like to think it might've gone a little bit different or it, it just might've changed things just a hair. Yeah, just having another score would have been a big difference maker for the Pacers, and and that's kind of been the, the case all along with this team. Like, the margin for error is very slim with the amount of guys you have on the team and guys that really aren't scorers. Like, thank goodness McDermott had a big night tonight in terms of his shooting. Obi Toppin had some big shots, like you mentioned. You know, he's still not the same level of player as Ben Matherin, and I, I think this is a good talking point, too, that I don't have on our list here, but I think we need to talk about it, is just the way the Pacers, and I think, I think you brought it up a little bit ago, how the Pacers went away – from having at least one of Halliburton and Siakam on the floor at all times and went to that all bench unit. And we kind of talked to Rick a couple of weeks ago about how that's been the case. And he said, yeah, we're trying to do that. I asked Siakam about it and he said he really likes playing it that way. But for whatever reason, they decided, oh, we're going to go with an all bench lineup. And I thought to myself, that's kind of interesting. They put Neesmith back in, I think, to guard LeBron and took Shepard out of the game. But still, it, it was a, a, a weird dynamic to me to see how they were going to generate offense. And that's when they let the Lakers get back into it after kind of creating that 11-point lead. And then that's when the momentum did start to shift. And the Pacers starters came back in the game, and they couldn't really kind of close the gap either. So it, it was just like a spiral effect, uh, a downward spiral effect, I should say, uh, of just, you know, maybe maybe not the right rotation there. And maybe the Pacers should have gone with more of a, a staggered lineup. But I, I will say the bench unit was much better in the second half. I think the other weird part, I know I'm kind of going all over, but I know like like back when we were in New York, Rick didn't want to play TJ the whole second half, I think, when either Tyrese or Nimhard got in foul trouble. And tonight, Miles got in the foul trouble. And then I don't know if Jalen Smith was struggling or he was in foul trouble too, but then he had to play Isaiah too. And typically, like Rick will go Miles and Jalen or Miles and Isaiah, but he won't typically go like three centers deep. 
And I think that was a unique challenge too, is that he had to go a little deeper and just get guys in at just weird timings because of the way it was being officiated too. I think he factored that in with like McDermott coming into the fold and Nimhard coming into the fold. Those guys have both kind of been hurt in and out and just don't have necessarily maybe the same chemistry. Um, so when we talk about just kind of like it being a weird game out there, I think that you do have guys kind of, I don't know if you want to say finding their roles, but then it's also just having the, the change things different than you ever like to. Cause like Rick just likes the stick probably I would say eight or nine deep and he had to go a little further than that. Um, again, because of miles and Nismith's troubles early. Yeah. I mean, I had this as a talking point for later down the road, but it's all right. We can bring it up yeah. now. Uh, yeah. Isaiah Jackson plays more backup five minutes over Jalen Smith after he struggled early in the game. Like Jalen was in the game and it just felt like he was a little bit slower to everything. And we saw how good Jackson was against the Lakers in the end season tournament that I felt like, okay, this, and I saw people putting this on Twitter too. So like, I'm not trying to take credit for this take, but like a lot of people are saying like Jackson should probably be in this game over Jalen Smith. And that's kind of uh, the, the, the move the Pacers made. And I thought it worked out pretty well. You saw some nice plays from Jackson athletically, just being able to protect the rim a little bit better, um, get out and transition a little bit more, be a little more physical because Jalen, I think he's only about six foot nine compared to Jackson, who's about six foot eleven. So that does make a big difference. When the Lakers are a team that has a lot of length, so that's a good point right there. You know, I, I just think that they felt like this was not a good matchup for Jalen Smith, and I, I'm not sure why. I, I felt like he could have been fine if they just let him play it out. Just he didn't really get a lot of run in this game, but. Yeah. They, they, they didn't want to trust it too long, and so they went to Ajax. But speaking of the in-season tournament and, and the defense of the Lakers, I, I felt like, once again, they were very impactful with guarding Tyrese Halliburton. Tyrese Halliburton did struggle in this game, had some threes there at the end to kind of make his scoring not look near as bad, but still didn't finish the game with a, with a great stat line. After having a great stat line against Golden State, you really felt like, you know, when you score 145 points and Tyrese Halliburton only has 12 on 5 of 13 shooting, you're trying to figure out where all those points came from. So, you know, 10 assists, another double-double for Tyrese, but he just really could not get things going offensively against this Lakers team. And I think that this is just a matchup problem for him because of how tall they are, how lengthy they are, and how physical they are defensively. I'd say I have to agree with you. I thought it was interesting, too. I was thinking a lot about the playoff matchups we might see tonight because I noticed like they definitely had them hard on Reeves, and then they had – Halliburton kind of hidden on um, Dinwiddie. So I had me thinking, you know, what are we going to look at? Like, let's say we have to match up against Garland and Mitchell, or we have to match up against um, Brunson at New York. Like, how are they going to not only hide him on D, but how are they going to work around the offense when they're trying to back it up and slow down the pace? Um, Because I think really that's what it comes down to it is if we can stay running and gunning, then Tyrese can stay flowing within the offense. But if we're, we're facing a team that, does force us to change, that does really clog the middle, and he can't distribute as much. I think that's where it's just been such a, a blessing to ask Yakim in. Um, I think that, like, the difference between in season tournament and tonight, and, like, while we were able to claw back a little more, um, was just, like, having Siakam there to kind of shoulder some of that as well. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, it's not directly addressing Halliburton's struggles, but it is just thinking big picture, like, how is this going to go in the playoffs and how are the teams going to implement things? And I think, you know, with Siakam really stepping up, they're going to have to change their strategy, I think probably to, to keep up with him a little more now, which could, I think, eventually not necessarily lighten the load of time, but definitely change how teams are game planning. Cause if Tyrese is, is going to keep slumping, I, I don't think he will, but like if he is having an off night though, I think teams are going to probably have to take note of Siakam after the last few stretch of games he's had. Yeah, it's it's a weird thing because it didn't feel like he was really looking for a shot as much either in this game. A pretty quiet night from Tyrese Halliburton. And defensively, like everybody knows, like Tyrese is not a great defender. So no. you're gonna have to kind of <laughs> take those, you know, you know, strides like they are. Like there's games when he plays pretty good. Like he had four steals and three blocks uh, against the Warriors. So you're thinking, okay, yeah. pretty good defensive game. And then in this game tonight, clearly just couldn't make the same impact. And I've personally felt like down the stretch in the fourth quarter, when they had him and McDermott out there together. That was just a recipe for disaster because, you know, McDermott is probably the worst defender on this team and that's playing in the rotation. And Tyrese is probably second worst. So you have your two worst defenders out there while Nimhart's trying to check into the game and the Lakers were able to attack that. So, you know, that that to me was a big point and like the Pacers trying to claw their way back into it. Like the Pacers, well, I don't think they had a timeout to really go out there and make that change. So they couldn't take a timeout to get a substitution. So 
that they were they were just kind of screwed out there with what they had until there was a dead ball possession where they could get in Nimhard for McDermott. But yeah, you're right. I mean, Tyrese, he's gonna have to figure things out. Is it's still kind of an up and down situation for him. You're you're kind of ready to like jump in after a big performance and be like, he's back. But in this game, once again, you kind of saw we're like, okay, maybe he's not all the way back yet, but he's making strides. He definitely is getting better. Like the three pointers, like that he was hitting at the end, they looked like tough shots. He was making them, so maybe he can kind of carry over from that. I'm, I'm assuming this is going to be a tough back to back. Although they're staying in the same place, the Clippers just lost in a pretty poor performance as well. And I, and I think that Indiana is going to have issues with the Clippers' length, just like they did with the Lakers' length with Kawhi and PG and those kind of guys out there. So we'll have to see how they bounce back. But sticking on this game. Uh, Something we need to talk about, and I and I feel very strongly about that, is just, you know, what we saw from Andrew Nimhard. I, I felt like Andrew Nimhard was really good in this game. McDermott was good in this game, and so was Siakam. But, you know, it, it feels like when everything was kind of getting rushed, Nimhard was one of the guys that was just really calm and, and under control. And I like that aspect of his game offensively. He doesn't really seem to take bad shots and doesn't rush into those shots. Sometimes you see Turner do that or Neesmith do that, but I felt like early on Nimhard was really solid in this game. Well, not only that, but I think like why he's just won so many brownie points, he's like teacher's pet with Rick, is that he just knows where to be. Like whether that's on offense or defense, he knows like just X's and O's, just kind of how to read things. And I think that's just been why it's been so much um, not so much. It's, it's, it's been, I think what's been, what surprised me though about him when we got him is that I didn't anticipate him. And like, I don't know, last year when we first got him having the size and everything he did. Um, so really like when you're watching him guard some of the other like point guards and stuff, like he is a, a big guy that you have to fly out there. Like he is not just like this lanky, I don't know, uh, a good cop. It's not like Darren Collison though. Like yeah. if you know what I'm saying, He's got some size. So I think, you know, on Reddit and some of the forms and stuff, people, I mean, kind of just like, why is he in if he's not hitting? Like, why isn't Rick pulling him? Because I know, like, his shot's not always there. But I will have him in there for his passing and his defense. Even when the shot's not falling, I think it hits enough to, to where I think he, he flies really under the radar. And I'm not going to be surprised where, like, it, come NBA playoffs, there's just, like, the Nimhard game. All of a sudden, they're talking about him on the low post, and Bill Simmons is all in on Nimhard Island. And, like, all of a sudden, he just gets, like, the NBA stat nerds just kind of wilding out because I think he is kind of like him and, like, Neesmith, I think, are both kind of our hidden gems, especially when Neesmith stays out of foul trouble. I think that they, they're kind of like the secret sauce, like where they might not necessarily always show on the box score, Um but the consistent positioning of both of them, I think we can't, like, game in, game out. Uh, just knowing how to be there to set other guys up, I think that's it's critical. So I don't really know where I'm going with it all. But I will say that I think that I think there's going to be some more fans on Nimhard Island here come a few weeks, come May, um, possibly round two of the playoffs. I'm not trying to get too far ahead. But yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty bullish on them. Yeah, so I was kind of curious where your what your thoughts were on Nimhard because the way you started out talking about teacher's pet, I wasn't sure if you were a a fan of him or you thought that oh, Rick was. Just, I'm a disciple. <laughs> you're a Nimhard disciple. Like, oh yeah, I get the flag. I kind of get why some people aren't in on him because like there's just some of those games where his shots just a little short. Um, and I think what's neat though is you can tell it doesn't mess with him mentally because I think he is just confident in who he is as a player. Um, I don't yeah. know if that's like I, I forget how many years he was in school. I don't know if it was three or four years, but I think that there's just that level of, of certainty that he has. I think with himself and with his game and with like how Rick has empowered him, um, starting as early last year, just having some of those moments to where it's just like I just feel like he's so comfortable, um, mm -hmm. more so than a lot of second year guys. Like it's just like he's already kind of a vet. Um, <laughs> And so I think that's kind of, I think, while I've been to him is, is he's just been kind of plugged in and just ready. Um, and I I didn't think we'd get that. And, I, you know, it could be like that even with, I don't want to get too far ahead, but, like, Shepard's kind of made smaller but similar strides to, I think, Nimhard is rookie year two, where he's just one of those guys where you can tell, like, once he gets some more time under his belt, it's similar to just basketball IQ. Um, so much of it 
I think, you know, it might not always show like on Sports Center or things like that. Uh, but if you're you're watching, you know, if you're like us hardcore dudes watching 50 or 60 games in a year, you just start to just pick up on guys that just that, that they have a basketball GPS. I know it's a funny term. I'm almost done with my rant here, but um, I'll never forget. I didn't have TV growing up to like eighth grade. So like Mike Wells and Bob Kravitz were my only way of really keeping up with the game. And I love Serena's just a Catholic. I don't know why I was attached to him, but I remember like Kravitz just writing this whole thing on him, just looking completely lost out there, um, saying he needed the GPS. And I was pretty upset with Kravitz. I don't know why I was like in the third grade, but I would say that like Nimhard just has a good GPS. I think that's what we're kind of going with here is that like, he's like a modern smart car. You could call him a Tesla where it's just in the dashboard, you know? <laughs> I like that reference, man. He's got a great GPS. You know, yeah. he's, a, he's a smart car. He's a Tesla. He's an EV. He's an EV. <laughs> <laughs> I love Carbon the analogy. Friendly. This, this yeah. is great. And, and being the mad at Krabby. Well, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Being mad at Krabby is not something that's uh, unfamiliar with fans of this show because he has had some strong takes about Miles Turner uh, in previous seasons. But uh, I, I think that everyone's kind of cooled off of that train and everyone kind of is in, enjoying the trade yeah. the trade rumor free season of Miles Turner this year, just being able to watch him play basketball and kind of analyze that. But yeah, Andrew Nimhart is such an interesting player. I really enjoy watching him play. And I believe he played two years at uh at Florida before he transferred to Gonzaga, then played two years at Gonzaga. So yeah, he to me, he is the best defender on this Pacers team. Now, this Pacers team is not great defensively, so that speaks, you know, large volumes to the rest of this team. I don't I don't think uh I don't know what the ceiling is for him defensively overall, but I do like the way that he competes defensively. And you're right. Uh, there could be a game where maybe he does stick out in the playoffs and really just lock somebody down. Uh, it'll be interesting to see who they get because while everybody's looking at Cleveland or New York, don't count out the magic. They're not too far behind and they've got a pretty light schedule still. So I think Orlando is a team you just never can count out. And I know the Pacers have struggled with Orlando this year in their size as well, but I think that would be a very interesting 3-6 matchup if that were the case. And maybe because of their lack of playoff experience, it would benefit Indiana, who does have guys that have been there before, a little bit more turns, Siakam and TJ McConnell. But uh, aside from that, I loved everything you said there about him. And I am kind of curious your thoughts on Benedict Matherin, because there was a conversation we had with David Thorpe a couple of days ago, and I shared a clip where, where Thorpe was talking about how the Pacers got better with Matherin not being in the lineup because of his de defensive inconsistencies and his on-off numbers being a, a minus. So uh, what are your thoughts on Benedict Matherin? And obviously you talked about how the Pacers miss him now, but like, what do you, what do you see from him so far? So for me, I feel like he's just trying to figure out who he is as a player. He has the drive and he's willing to put in the work, but he's just not fully sure where to put all the energy. So he has, I think a lot of that raw talent, the raw scoring, and the desire to play well on defense. And I think with all that, it's just figuring out how to make that work with Tyrese, how to kind of make that work with Rick. I think what's hard is I don't know how well Tyrese and him naturally fit because I feel like they both need the ball to do things. And so it's, it's a little bit hard, I think, for them to play in tandem sometimes. But I think it's just something that will play itself out because I think he does inherently have that that inner just want, like that inner desire that, that – I, you know, he wants to be great, he, 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 maybe some misplaced confidence, but, like, I feel like he, he doesn't have that quit, and, you know, he might not always take things personal, and he's willing to put in the time. And I know that's just, like, a bunch of warm, fuzzy thoughts, but I, I, I think just – there's something I was talking about a little bit earlier with Smith, where, you know, he kind of – like, with Smith, he's always crashing the floor, crashing the boards, running up and down a lot of energy. I think that Matherin has a little bit of that, but he also just has – an a, maybe a more natural shooting ability and ability to get to the rim. I mean, he just draws so much contact. Um, maybe he gets a friendlier whistle the more he's in the league. I just remember when he was a rookie, I was shocked at how much he was getting to the line. I mean, and uh, maybe tonight you have a guy like him getting to the line, helping with the free throw discrepancy from time to time. Um, but I think, you know, uh, the cream rises to the top. I think eventually – the work and all that will come through, but I mean, he's young and we just got to give him some time. And I think that's like one of the, the more frustrating parts being an Indiana sports fans, you know, with IU fans, it's the five banners with the Colts. It was Peyton. And it's just like these unrealistic expectations so early that we put on people. I mean, it's year two. 
Um, definitely a lot better than one of our other lottery picks, like Jonathan Bender, year two. I mean, if we're talking other lottery picks that we've had year two, I mean, you look at Rick Schmidt's year two. We haven't had a lot of lottery picks as early as Ben, as early as Darius. And I think it, it's not going to be coming off the bench. He wasn't supposed to be Anthony Edwards, you know. Um, so I think that here locally, I think it's just allowing him to become him over time. That's kind of the end of my soapbox. I just think people kind of need to calm down and cool their jets a little bit. Yeah, and I understand that he is very young. And like you mentioned, like why Nimhart is more advanced as a player right now is because he does have more basketball playing experience playing four years in college and 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 getting to those opportunities to really compete at the highest level. I know that Ben was at Arizona, but he was really only – like the main focal point of that team for one season. So it's a little bit different. And we know the ceiling probably is still higher for Benedict Mathern. And and I think people need to just like, I think people realize that, but like at this point now, like the Pacers are trying to win and, and Nimhart is just a better fit next to Tyrese at the two for trying to win games uh, this season. So the yeah, same thing with Ben Shepard, like a four-year player at Belmont, like just a kid that, you know, does a great job. And I, I was going to bring this up earlier. I forgot to do it, but it just hit me. I don't yeah. think I've seen a rookie in my life be so disciplined on shot fakes. That guy never bites on pump fakes. Have you noticed that? No, I picked up on it. Like, wait, I don't know how to put it. It just doesn't, you don't feel like it's exposed. Like yes. sometimes you just see a rookie in and you just like, you know, that they're, they're cooked, but not with him. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah, he has the slips here and there, but you can kind of tell he has a good, he, you put him at the tee box, he can read the green pretty well. Yeah, so third grade gentry love Serenish as a Yeah, uh, I'm curious, who would be your your all time five of players oh, you love no. for this Pacers team? I know who your favorite oh. is, but uh, your top five, uh, I guess maybe your starting five of Pacers love Pacers you've loved Pacers I've loved since you've been. It's so hard. Uh, so Serenus is not on the list. I'll just say Kravitz was right. He did need a GPS. That was a, that was a great phase. But if I'm going top five, it's the the first three are staples. Um, we got good old Uncle Reggie, born ready Lance Stevenson, of course, Mr. Feisty, Jeff Foster. Those final two spots get difficult. Um, I think I just love the loyalty of Danny Granger. I think I just grew up in that era. It's hard for me to leave him off. Um, and it gets tough. I mean, Big Dog Roy hooked me up with my season tickets for two years. I mean, my memories I'll cherish forever through those conference finals runs. I mean, I just owe a lot to him for that. Um, but it's hard picking between him and Tyrese. And with Tyrese, there's some recency bias. So I think, you know, we'll just make this a heritage top five, a legacy top five, um, and we'll keep it Reggie, Lance, Danny, Jeff Foster, and then my man, Big Roy. You know, it's hard. It, it's hard. It's hard picking between the, the current and the past. I think I got to allow some of this to settle with Tyrese because the – the hype train is pretty high right now, but we've been through the hype train with PG and Oladipo, and I think Tyrese will be a lifer. I don't think it's going to end up that way with him. I don't think we'll get that toxic, but I don't know if I'm putting them in my top five yet. It's been an awesome two years, but we're very much on the honeymoon still. So, you know, we got to figure out how to eat the five home life work still. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. I love it, man. Yeah, and I was I was waiting for the Jeff Foster drop because I know you have been a Jeff Foster truther from day one like that was your number one guy like I, I feel like you liked him over everybody else so we'll just go here's my rant he's the indiana pastries forest gum if we talk through it he scores the last bucket in market square arena he has larry bird as a coach isaiah thomas as a coach i mean he played with reggie miller and chris mullen and rick smiths and dale davis and then he played with that young core of Reg, uh, roy lance and PG, he was there with, with Frank Vogel as well. I mean, he was there for the malice. He was there for the drought. I mean, he was there with Sarunas and Dunleavy and Troy Murphy. It, it's wild to think, like, he survived the dark ages of Jim O'Brien and, and Jamal Tinsley. I mean, he was there, I think, for all of it. The 2000 finals, the the renaissance that we kind of went through just before. He played in that Bulls series in 2010, and then he retired before our first run in with the Heat. Um, when we are, I think, a seven and they were a two. But it's it. other than, like, Nick Collison on the Thunder, I think it's hard to find a player that, like, was a part of that much, I think, history within a team's, like, timeline. I think it's pretty special. So yeah. he has that soft spot in my heart. And, of course, the Indiana grind, 
you know, the hard fouls, the old school hits. You, you just don't see players like him anymore. I mean, I don't know if he'd make it with Twitter or X. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think people probably appreciated Jeff Foster more for what he did. Just just the rebounds alone would be great for this Pacers team, uh, seeing how t- at times they do struggle to rebound the basketball. Jeff Foster was one of the most feistiest rebounders out there. Uh, that dude would walk away with cuts and scratches all over the place, bruises. I mean, he was just – well, a- if we're talking about the fouls tonight, he would have made those fouls count, man. I mean, he probably would have held LeBron probably in tears or at least even the change of diaper in the locker room. I mean, honest to God – I don't know. I mean, you know, you talk about Draymond. He wasn't necessarily dirty. He would just make it count. Like, if he hit you, he hit you good, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think um, the day and age of the Pampers, that is the modern NBA. That we could use a little more of – I'm not calling for violence or Grayson Allen type stuff, but I'm just saying, like, if you're going up, I mean, don't make it a slap. I mean, just make it – man, this is sounding bad. I need to slow down. But you know what I mean, though? It's just – I think – I call I would call it maximizing um, the physicality. I don't know how to put it because I don't like that Bill Lambeer type of stuff. I'm not calling for that, but I'm just saying I think uh, foul inefficiency is what we'll call it. You know? Yeah, so. make a good hard foul, but make it make it legal, but make it count. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. You know? No, I, I think sometimes guys are afraid to put somebody on their butt in a nice way. You know, if you're going to try to block a shot, like make sure they don't finish the layup too when you go to block the shot. Like just give them a good hard foul. Let them know that you're uh, aware of their presence in the paint, that kind of thing. You're not trying to take anybody's legs out or, you know, try to end somebody's career, but just send a message. And, and I know that he, I know that he did that in the 2011 playoffs against the Chicago Bulls, got some flagrant fouls called on him against Derrick Rose because he was not letting him get to the line. But I mean, even then the physicality of the NBA was much more intact than it is now. You know, in 2K back in the day, you could buy the brick wall badge. And, like, he wasn't just a brick wall. He was like a cinder block wall, a concrete wall. Like, his XP on that would be through the roof. So, like, I, I'm just making sure I don't get canceled or something. I work in HR, and so I'm not. I'm trying not to get canceled. But what I'm just saying is, like, forget the brick wall, dude. We don't have a whole lot of steel walls if you want to call that anymore so yeah um yeah old soul here and you know he's he he brought it every night you know we were talking about ben and we were talking about i think neesmith earlier and i think that's what i really just like seeing out of guys um we're talking about former pacers but some of that david west stuff i think is kind of missing um these Mm. days just the enforcer you know so yeah all love there there, there was times, and I've even brought it up on the podcast this year, when Pascal Siakam was hitting like that mid-range jumper where it felt like a David West shot. Um, but you know, it, it's he's not the same physical level of player, but he's, I think he's. You could probably say Pascal Siakam is a more talented player than David West, right? Yeah, more talented, but I would say similar cadence. Where it's silent but great works in the shadows, does that stuff to where it raises your team ceiling so much, but without screaming or being loud about it. But it's just like when he's there, the difference when he's not is just like it. it it's kind of like I don't know in the Marvel movies. I know that they replaced the actor uh, that played Rhodey between the first and the second Iron Man, and I think Don Cheadle's done immensely better in that role. And I don't know. I would say, you know, Pascal Siakam is is adding Don Cheadle. I think instead of Terrence Howard. I don't know. I'm sorry, Terrence Howard is catching strays out here, but. That's kind of that's kind of the comp though. It's just he, he brings you up another tier, and it's not necessarily the loudest casting choice, um, but it's it's saying something. I respect the it's movie getting reference. late. I don't. It's getting late. I'm sorry. It's it's like this late night. Anything kind of goes after midnight energy now on the pod. Uh, it's after one twenty as we're recording this. So <laughs> have, have no worries, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate Gentry for staying up and and doing this pod. But we're gonna go ahead and close things out here now. So Gentry, I mean. You talked about X. Is there anything you'd like to plug before I let you go? Oh, no, nothing to plug here. I just thank you for having me on. It's been so great watching your ride. Um, I know just it's not easy in the modern age to kind of start, stop, continue. Anything that you're putting out is like a creator. Um, so just keep doing what you're doing. I'm proud of you as a friend that kind of watch you from the sidelines. Um, nothing to plug, but, hey, keep setting the pace. Keep doing your thing, my friend. Hey, you keep setting the pace with your travel. I enjoy the videos. The vlogs are great. Uh, Gentry is an adventurer. So I would say if you can find him on social media, just check it out because Gentry is, he's always been a great follow on social, but now you're getting like these dope pics. Like 
sitting behind the basket at Pacers Bulls, even the Pacers lost, like what a game to be at courtside for. So like Gentry's just making his rounds, like was in the building for Pacers Knicks in New York. So, you know, I, I will just say I respect the hustle, man. I respect the grind. So I'm doing the grind on this side of things. You're doing the grind on the other thing. So uh, I, I respect it from afar, man. I really do. Well, hey, let's hope we can reset the pace tomorrow night. L.A. round two. Hopefully the legs aren't too soggy. Hopefully the shirts aren't too groggy. Um, and let's just hope we can make PG regret dumping us, you know. Um, let's, let's have some of that Kelly Clarkson energy since he's been gone. Um, give him his roses and, you know, just make him make him regret leaving us tomorrow. I, I know uh, – the, the PG stuff is a little well warm. I'm looking forward to this and I'm looking forward to a Patriots bounce back. So um don't know how to close these things, but I'll just leave y'all with that. Is I'm calling Tears by 10. Um you heard it here. Let's get another dub tomorrow. All right, Pacer Nation. We'll be back for another recap tomorrow. I'll be joined by JMV, the rabbit JMV. You guys hear him weekly from three to six on 107.5 the fan. He'll be joining me to recap Pacers Clippers. And then Caitlin Cooper will be joining me Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, uh, when you guys probably listen to that for an episode there. But if you can follow us on Twitter at Pacers Pod SDP, I'm at Alex Golden NBA, and we'll talk to y'all tomorrow.